Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Carol Lawali. I'm the Associate Director of External Relations in the Career Engagement Office here at Seattle University. And I'm so happy that all of you are able to join us. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. This event is being recorded today and um, we want to welcome our guest here and I'll give uh, Mary Lou a chance and opportunity to introduce her properly. Uh, we thank all the students who are here and the Graduate Student um, Council for being our student uh, co-hosts uh, for today's event. Just so you know, um, please use the chat feature to ask your questions. Uh, we have uh, Abby and Justin and also um, uh, Cheyenne and Bagriashi who, are, who will be monitoring that. Um, and also, um, you know, encourage and let our speaker know that you're following. So please use the reactions to, you know, clap and encourage her. And so she, you know, acknowledging what she's saying. So um, I, um, we often do a land acknowledgement and because we couldn't, um, it's sort of been taken offline right now, I'll use a modified version of it uh, that we have. Um, and this has been put together by our um, Indigenous Peoples Institute and um, Campus Ministry. So, and it's always good to acknowledge the land where we're sitting on today. So like uh, we're in the traditional land of the people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor the gratitude the land itself, the Duwamish tribe has had have contributed to us here today. So without further ado, uh, Mary Lou, um, welcome. Thanks, Carol. Students, thanks for being here today. And um, we're excited to have Keisha Jackson with us today to talk about imposter syndrome. Before I do a real quick intro on Keisha, just I'm so very thankful for the partnership with the Career Engagement Office to host these quarterly Courageous Career Conversations. Um, so today our, our conversation is on the imposter syndrome. So Keisha Jackson, uh, our keynote speaker is a proud SU alum student. She's a graduate of our Master's in Student Development Administration program. Um, she's also an Albers mentor for us. Keisha currently has uh, just been recently changed her role within Microsoft and now is a business program manager in Microsoft Philanthropies. Uh, a couple months ago when I approached Keisha on this topic, uh, our conversation was so rich and fruitful as when she was doing her master's program in student development, she was very interested in student identity and in particular uh, working with um, underrepresented minority youth. So students, Keisha's got some thoughts planned for us, maybe uh, give us some food for thought, and then we will turn it over to our Graduate Student Council to start off the Q&A. And as Carol mentioned, we'll encourage you to also put some of your questions in the chat, bunk, jump, the chat function as well. <laughs> so with that, with further ado, I'll turn it over to Keisha. Thank you, Keisha, for being here. Wonderful, thank you so much. Is this sharing the correct screen? Is it showing with PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Let me go into presentation mode and see if that, okay. So hopefully, hopefully it's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, let me caution by saying, though I work at Microsoft, technology is not my friend. And <laughs> I, I frequently have issues with technology. It's just, you know, it's just the, the nature of the beast, I suppose you would say. Um, anyways, I am very excited to be here with all of you, Mary Lou. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, to share in this conversation with everyone. I'm gonna minimize my screen and hopefully if something starts happening with technology, please come off of mute and tell me that something's happening strange. Um, so as you all know, you're here to talk about, have a courageous conversations and I really hope this will be a conversation. I'm actually uh, what we would call robust over talker. So I'm actually timing myself to make sure uh, that this stays within about 25 minutes and then we get to the Q and A uh, portion of this conversation as this is a courageous career conversation. 
Uh, so we're gonna talk about imposter syndrome. I dropped a couple notes into the chat. Please do ask any questions you have there. I'm excited to dialogue with you all in this virtual setting. I also put a link to an article that I collaborated with Seattle U marketing office on about three or four years ago, maybe four and a half years ago. Time is time is doing something funny, um, but I put a link uh, into the uh, into the chat from Seattle Times where I uh, gave my perspective on when I was a higher ed. Uh, professional working with students and grappling with this topic around imposter syndrome and some of the concepts that I learned when I was in the master's program for student development administration at Seattle U. And so please do check that out. It's a very quick three, four minute read. I'm gonna give some uh, great uh, thoughts on that. So I do wanna let you all know that I'm excited to be here. And um, as was mentioned, the sponsorship from the Albers Placement Center, Career Engagement Office and Grad Student Council, very much appreciative of the partnership. And I'm excited to get started. So here we go. This is me. This is everything <laughs> you need to know about me. Before I start talking to you about imposter syndrome, I, I have to share and disclose a bit about my identity, uh, just so you kind of uh, you get a, a snapshot of who I am um, as a person, how I come to this work in this conversation, in this dialogue we're going to have. So uh, this is truly a glamour shot of me. That is me at my my, my best friend's wedding. I was maid of honor in her wedding. Lots of uh, uh, photography and, and you know different things that happen at weddings and so glamour shot of course uh, so that is this is when I think about how I wake up every day this is not it <laughs> this is not how I wake up every day that Beyonce song is lying to you I did not wake up like this this takes work to get here and I share that because battling with grappling with imposter syndrome is the, a similar thing we see a picture of ourselves that's all glamorous and made up and, and fancy in our minds and that's how um, a lot of the, the the inklings of imposter syndrome starts that way. Like I have a slide, it's full of my family, my world travels, my, my academic uh, accolades and my job at Microsoft and all those things. But that's not, that's not something that happened overnight. That's not uh, who I am as, as a total person. And I think that my um, rationale of wanting to show you this screen was this is how we always try to present ourselves look at all these accomplishments that we have and this is how I exist in the world and you know I'm so fantabulous and everything which is true but it's a lot of hard work it's a lot of hard work um, on a daily basis it's a lot of hard work in collaboration with other people and it's a lot of self-work and that's what I'm going to end this presentation with is the inside job that we all have to do in order to combat imposter syndrome every day. And so as you'll see from this slide, I um, am somebody who <laughs> is very much uh, color, very colorful. I'm, very, I'm a very colorful, extroverted person and somebody who loves quotes as well. And so my favorite quote that my uh, my best friend, we were in college together, uh, we rooted ourselves in this quote. It's by the late, great Dr. Maya Angelou. And it says, a woman who is convinced that she deserves to accept only the best challenges herself to give the best, then she's living phenomenally. And I frequently alter Maya Angelou's words and say a person. So it's applicable to everyone. When you think about how you challenge yourself, how you go deep within yourself to be the best version of who you are. And so from that moving clock words, there's pictures of my family over here, uh, my mother, my grandmother, a lot of lessons around uh, community and strength and courage and kindness that I've received throughout my life uh, from both my grandmother and my mother. Um, then here's my siblings and my stepfather and my mother. Um, you know, families uh, a very deep value and, and, and it gives me a sense of purpose and of who I am as well. And so I'm very uh, thankful for my family. And then I have some pictures of uh, my global travels here. Um, I really spent a lot of time um, thinking about who I am as a global citizen, how I've traveled the world and what a blessing and privilege it is to travel all over the world. Um, and so here's a picture of me, I'm in uh, Prague on um, this picture and then in Athens in the ruins. And then um, when I was studying abroad as a college student, I'm in a uh, in, in uh, Kumasi, which is the home of kente cloth. And so I'm in a kente loom uh, here in this picture there. And then, um, so just moving to this, I'm gonna skip this section really quickly here, but I went to Western as undergrad, studied sociology and communication. Uh, sociology is my first academic love, which is the study of people, which I really, really deeply enjoy. Um, and I, I have to list these things alphabetically because I'm super type A. However, since sociology is my first love, I always mention that one first. And then of course, as I mentioned before, I went to Seattle University College of Education for my master's degree 
um, in student development administration. I worked at College Success Foundation, which is a local nonprofit that focuses on college access. And I worked in higher ed, both at Seattle University and at the University of Washington. This is a picture here in the corner of me with a couple of my mentees from the UW and of course the dog um, as well. And then I'm deeply rooted in community service and community engagement as a principle of who I am as a person. And so I've served on the Seattle Women's Commission. I've served with Treehouse for Kids. And uh, this is just a picture of the phenomenal cohort of women that I served with for six years on the uh, Seattle Women's Commission. And then finally, um, in the center here, oh, let me go back there. Um, there, you know, it's very like business school like, which I did not go to business school, you'll note, but it's very business school like and also uh, Microsoft like to take all these uh, personality assessments to understand how you work with people. And so there's an exam. Or, um, an assessment called insights. And so everybody at Microsoft takes the insights and uh, there's some of my um, results here. So sunshine yellow, shocking to no one. I'm very people centered. Um, and then the green one really uh, refers to your values and how you're rooted in the earth or in your values. And so those are the top two indicators for me, which is kind of uh, a very different cadence than what you'd expect for from a business and tech professional at Microsoft. And then Strengths Finder, love the Strengths Finder. I'll just highlight my top two. I like to maximize and focus on time, talent, people, potential, and think around how do we get to our best selves. And then Woo, which is all about how do you win others over. And so I just quickly wanted to share that so that you get a sense of who I am as a person and how I approach this information. Okay. So the meat of our conversation, imposter syndrome, what is it? So just thinking back to everything I just shared with you in a quick few minutes about um, some accolades and successes and uh, different aspects of my life that have led me to this point in my career in my life. Um, imposter syndrome is that voice that comes up with deep within your in your mind and your spirit and your essence, right? And you're going along with your life. You all are affiliated with this fine institution, Seattle University. You've had different accolades and different moments in your life. You've worked really hard to achieve these accolades. And now you're in a space where you are sitting in the classroom or you are sitting in your office and that, that voice pops up in the back of your head that says, I shouldn't be here. What if, what if the hiring manager or the leadership team finds out, I don't know what I'm doing. Actually, I wasn't really paying attention in my course of study, earning my degree, and they're all going to find out that I don't know what I'm talking about, right? It's that that self-doubt talk that, that starts popping up in our heads. Why? For, like, where does that come from? That's the next slide. <laughs> but that's what it is. It's that that voice that comes out of nowhere. It's, it's usually internalized uh, belief that you don't deserve everything that you've worked hard to achieve. That's imposter syndrome. And then over on the other side of the screen, it's that that mental image. Oh, this is how much information I know. And then when I compare myself to my colleagues and other folks, this is what they know, right? When in reality, we're all operating with a certain body of knowledge. We all know different things, sure, but not to say that someone knows more than you or you know more than that person. And that's the, the, the root of imposter syndrome is it has you, leads you to believe that other people are so much further along and so far, uh, so far advanced, either intellectually, financially, mentally, emotionally, all of these different comparative things that we do between ourselves and others, whether it's with your family, with your friends, with colleagues in the classroom. It happens every day. So the question is, why does imposter syndrome bubble up within each of us? And this is where I put on my fancy uh, sociologist hat and get deep within some systems. So we have media, we have um, images that are that are coming out in television shows, in movies, and uh, in books, and the narratives that are sold to us of what success looks like. Right. So that's one part. Then we have what sociologists in the U.S. call the Big Five. We have family, religion, the economy, government, and education. These are all institutions and systems that we walk through and navigate through every day. And while a lot of folks are walking around the world, and of course right now we're in a pandemic and this is a different version of walking around the world, but you all know what I mean, so stay with me. <laughs> um, 
we start being very comparative about what other people have going on. So I have this image on the other side of the screen and this person, you know, everyone's walking around thinking like everybody else in this room, in this space, in my workplace, in the classroom, in my family, everyone seems to have it together, right? So we think about family, how, whether that's the family you're born into or the family you choose, how you uh, create values there. And sometimes those values are informed again by media, you know, um, movies and TV and books and, um, you know, the written uh, news and whatnot. And then we have, uh, if you are a part of a religious order or a religious affiliation, we have uh, questions and standards that um, we're accountable to in the, that institution. Then we have the idea of money and the economy and the fact that in this country, things are so rooted in the idea of success means you're economically successful, means you can afford X, Y, and Z material possessions, and that allows you to have a status. And then we have our government, which in the past year, that's just a whole other thing. However, um, the government as an institution, it's, it's a preserved order. It's long existing. It is a structure and political order that we all snap to in some form or fashion. And so when we think about the structure of our government, we think about order and structure, our beliefs, how our values, which typically come from our values taught to us by our family, our religion, and how we think about um, access to resources, which comes from the economy, all of those things lead back into the government and our experiences with whether it's local, state, um, or national government. And then finally, we have education. And that's you know one of our oldest institutions. That's the institution we are virtually sitting in right now. And that gets into the idea of um, in order to access a lot of the privileges and resources, you need to go through the process of education. A lot of folks come to the university campus and feel like this university was not uh, designed with them in mind, which going back into the deep history of the creation of educational institutions, a lot of institutions were not designed with people of diverse backgrounds in mind. So that is, um, that is a systemic truth and it gets back into the idea of the roots of systemic racism and the idea of keeping folks um, from accessing resources that would then allow them to achieve economic success, right? And so as you start thinking, this is probably a little bit deeper than some folks might have uh, planned on, but as you start thinking about what uh, what, why, why this imposter syndrome is coming up, I'm an individual person, but when you start comparing yourself in a community, in a societal structure, when you start thinking about media and the big five institutions that I just mentioned, this is where these, these thoughts and these feelings are starting to come up from, right? So the next question is, how do you identify it, right? And I'm sure as I've been talking, many of you have been thinking like, oh, I can think about times I've been sitting with my family, times I've been sitting with my friends, times I've been with my significant other, times that I've been in my classroom or at work where these um, these little little moments, you know, start popping up in your brain, these little voices start coming up. And it's like, what do you do with that, right? How do you identify it? What do you notice that's happening with your physical being when imposter syndrome is starting to rear its ugly head? So at the bottom of the screen here on this slide, I listed out five different types of um, imposter syndrome that might pop up in you, right? So you might have the perfectionist that comes top of mind that says, I have to finish this paper. It has to be flawless. I cannot show it to my team, the other students in my group, or I can't show it to the professor until it's absolutely flawless, perfect, perfect, which means you could spend a lifetime trying to perfect a piece of work, right? Or there's the concept of someone that wants to be a super person, superman, superwoman, super person. They want to be the be all end all for everyone around them while they're not taking care of themselves. Or third, there's a person that's the natural genius. They want to say, I'm smarter than anybody else that's ever to exist, that's ever been a part of this work team or this work stream or this project team. And I know it all. I always have to lead and I have to be out in front. But then that person's putting on so much internalized pressure to be perfect that they can never meet that goal because none of us is perfect. We're all human. We're all lifelong learners. No one is the expert on all things. And we all have to own our own space of what it is that we do well. Next is the um, 
the, uh, the soloist. That person is, they are out here. They're saying, I don't need to be part of the team. I'm not part of the band. I am the soloist. I am Keisha Jackson. I am, I am the lead guitarist of this band. And my, my piece and my part in this work is what matters, right? It's that, that idea of kind of a lone wolf in some ways. And then the expert goes back to that person. You can't tell them anything. They, <laughs> they know it all. They don't need your input. They don't need to, uh, you know, be informed or have their mind changed. They are the expert on all things, and that is just it, right? So those are the the five uh, ways. That, those are five examples of how imposter syndrome can start bubbling up, and how you can start casting yourself in this identity that you need to know more than anyone, you need to lead, you need to be perfect, all of these different things. And again, it goes back to what I was just saying around societal expectations through the media, through family, through government, through education, so on and so forth, that we're kind of cast ourselves as the expert, the leader that doesn't need help when the truth is we're all human, we're all learning every day. There's no person on this planet that knows everything that does not have work to do on themselves, within themselves and within their community. And so when these storylines start happening within people, they start feeling uh, what's in the image here. You might start feeling fear or stress. You might have a lack of self-awareness. You might notice your body is um, physically reacting to the idea of, um, to the uh, to the idea of I will I will be found out. Someone's going to know that I don't belong here because that's the narrative that you're you're telling yourself on the inside. And so, um, I, before I start saying this incorrectly, on one side of the screen are um, indicators of how it's popping up. So fear, stress, anxiety, insecurity, conflict within yourself. On the other side of this funnel, you'll see here are ways to combat, to identify, and then work the stress or the fear or the anxiety from imposter syndrome through its own system, right? So you have curiosity as a way of, let me be a learn-it-all, not a know-it-all. Self-aware, actually taking a moment to, to investigate your own self-awareness. Have you done the work uh, to be curious, to understand what's going on around you? Have you done an assessment of the other folks around you, their expertise, their knowledge, and how you might learn from them, which also leads into the next one around learning. Um, and listening it really is a big part of learning is listening to other people being in dialogue and not assuming that we're all natural geniuses or we're the experts and we have no work to do. Um, relating back to curiosity is really asking questions. What are the questions that maybe you haven't asked yourself or that haven't been asked in this group project or in your conversation with your mother or your significant other? Like taking that moment to ask questions will give you a, a time to pause, to breathe and actually assess what's going on. And if imposter syndrome is popping up, asking questions will help you get to the root question of, is this true, right? That's a big question to ask yourself. If you start feeling like, I don't belong here, nobody likes me, nobody wants me here, always get back to the root question of asking, is this actually true? Is it true that no one likes you? Is it true that you don't deserve to be here? Where is that narrative coming from? And actually investigating it by asking yourself questions. And then of course, being real. Um, and that's the assessment of being in the reality of everybody here is learning and in their own journey, no one's perfect. And by trying to cast other people as perfect in your universe, in your space, in your community is a fast pathway to feeling like you don't belong in your own space. All right, with a few minutes remaining here, I'll have a sip of water, <laughs> I've been talking a lot. I just wanna talk about a couple tools that I think um, are personally important to working through imposter syndrome. The first one, and this is really, really, really huge for me. And I think that during this last year of everyone living through this pandemic and what our, our world has become is I hope people, that are able to have the time to do the inside job, do the inside work, and actually ask yourself those questions and bring yourself to a space of self-awareness and stop looking for external validation as a means to happiness. Happiness is an inside job. Self-contentment is an inside job. Um, your accountability as an adult to yourself and to other people starts with yourself. If you're not first and foremost accountable to your own schedule, your own health, your own wellness, how can you help other folks? It's like that 
and um, the when you when you uh, when we used to ride airplanes, <laughs> when you get on the plane and uh, you know we used to fly, and they would start off and they say, "Put your own oxygen mask on first before you can help other people." Right? If you're out here looking at other people and trying to invest in their wealth, their happiness, but you're not filling your own well, that is the the fastest path to unhappiness, to comparative um, narratives and things of that nature. It's, oh, I'm looking at everybody else instead of looking in the mirror and doing the inside work. That is how people get off course and quickly start the pathway to imposter syndrome by looking at other people and what they have. When in truth, we have no idea when somebody is in their season of success, we have no idea what losses they have experienced in order to achieve that success. Everybody wants to be the Beyonce out here and everybody wants to be uh, you know, the star of the show and have success and achieve their dreams. But the work that goes into that, once people find out, okay, oh, in order to get to this level of success or to get to this accomplishment, I have to do all of this work because it's true, everybody has to do a pathway of work. It's a journey of work in order to get to the goal, right? So once we understand that, we'll stop looking at other people's journey and understand that the sun and the moon each shine in their own time and they don't compare. They don't try to take over what is daytime or nighttime and when it's their proper time to shine, right? And I use that analogy because um, it's, it's a reference to how the earth moves and timing. And when it's sensible for you to be in the, the space of success, right? The next one is really about protecting your peace. A lot of times, and this goes back to what I'm saying about working on yourself, working on your own life needs first before trying to help other people. If you haven't done the work on yourself, it's very, very difficult to try to be out, be out in whatever space in the world, really, trying to help other people. So you need to protect your own peace. Don't allow other people, even if it's your family, your significant other, to disrupt your peace. That is a, a very dangerous path, pathway to imposter syndrome as well. If you allow other people to become your priority before you have prioritized yourself, many times the peace that you have worked so hard to achieve will, will cease to exist. And so you have to really protect your own mental, emotional peace before you can engage with other people who might need to be doing their own work at step one again. And then the last one, this is my, my, my phrase from 2020 and the, the best lesson that I learned is delay is not denial. Just because you haven't made you know, your salary goals or you haven't finished your program in the exact timeline you thought or received the raise or promotion on your timeline does not mean it's not coming. Sometimes you have to wait because the timing isn't right or the situation isn't the best for your success. And you have to really assess that Oh, there we go, perfectly on time. You have to really assess that um, a delay is not a no, you know? It's not a, it's a not right now or take a different pathway or a different approach. And that's, I think, uh, a really important lesson, especially after the year we just experienced and whatever it's gonna look like going forward, we have to slow down and reassess why we're doing what we're doing. Does the time make sense? Does the opportunity make sense? And to also understand there's more than one pathway to success. There's actually, what, over 7 billion people on this planet. There's over 7 billion pathways to success. It looks different for everyone. And when we take the time to not be comparative to other people's journey, then we can do the inside work to investigate what's important for our own journey. Okay, with that, thank you so much. I'm ready for the question, the Q&A part, which will be very, very fun. Um, I'll just leave you on the, the note of, of healthiness, like go forth and set the world on fire, but also wash your hands, mask up and stay safe and healthy. <laughs> Thank you, Keisha. Yes. Really appreciate it. Okay, I'm gonna now turn it over to Cheyenne Carlson and Balyashi um, from our Grad Student Council. Students, they're gonna, administer the Q&A for us. So Cheyenne, Shri, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, hi. And uh, Kesha, thank you so much for that presentation. I can tell that you like inspirational quotes. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> and to hear about your colorful lifestyle yes. and just like the insights about our comparative behavior, I think it's relevant for all of us. I am Cheyenne. <laughs> um, I am the Vice Chair of Community Relations with the Graduate Student Council. And actually, Bhagada Shri 
is going to be our facilitator. He is the representative from the College of Science and Engineering. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to here, her. But thank you so much, Kesha. That was really fabulous and really insightful. Yeah. Hi, Kesha. Thank Hi. you for wonderful insights. I hope like we really enjoyed it and everyone like it's really impressed with all the insights which you have given us on imposter syndrome. Uh, I would like to ask you the first question. In the professional world, some feelings of self-doubt are very normal. <clears throat> so how do you distinguish that from having imposter syndrome? Yeah, that's a um, <laughs> that's a really, really great question. And I, I distinguish the difference between your intentionality around learning. If you go into, I'll, I'll use my personal example. Like I, I worked in nonprofit and higher ed for 11 years before I went to Microsoft. I do not have a traditional business background. I went from working at University of Washington Foster School of Business into a business strategy and marketing manager role for worldwide commercial business at Microsoft, one of the greatest companies in the world, by the way. <laughs> Just side note there. <laughs> um, and there's a difference between having a learning curve self-doubt in the workplace, as you say, and uh, understanding that, okay, I don't have a business background, but I have uh, investment from a leader who wants to see me successful and thrive in this position and in this space, right? Very different from imposter syndrome, which would, uh, that narrative would say, I don't belong at Microsoft. I don't deserve to be here. Somehow, the hiring manager and the hiring committee, I duped them. I tricked them into hiring me. I put on a fancy show during my interview and now they're gonna find out that I don't know what I'm doing, what I'm saying, and I have no relevancy to this position and to Microsoft. Very different narratives. One, I have a learning curve. I have great leadership who's invested in me. I'm a little nervous about learning in this company of 170,000 top tier tech professionals. However, I'm invested because leadership has made an investment in me. Self-doubt turned into a pathway of learning. The idea that I did something wrong or I tricked someone, how could this happen? Unhealthy narrative that bubbles its head as an imposter syndrome and leads people to either quitting the workforce, quitting academic programs, or not trying at all, which, all, which I think is probably the, the worst outcome of imposter syndrome is when people talk themselves into a narrative to, to the point where they don't even want to attempt to go after their goals or their dreams because they think they themselves are unworthy. And that actually makes me think about uh, the great uh, professor and public speaker and psychologist Brene Brown. She talks about this a lot. It's rooted in the idea of shame, which is different than what I did was wrong or what, you know, you know, what, what or how I facilitate something that's wrong. It's more the idea that I am wrong. I, there's some, some aspect of shame that I don't belong or I shouldn't be here or people will find out that I'm a fraud. That's the, the, the essence of imposter syndrome. That's nice. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so do you think uh, like the advanced degrees help or exacerbate uh, the problem? For example, someone pursuing an MBA and taking more and more responsibility can fe uh, feel like expectations and uh, um, like expectations for specialized uh, knowledge is only for growing. Yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> I also say this, you know, the caution that everybody in this space is pursuing a degree of some sort or works for Seattle University, right? I earned a master's degree at Seattle U. So this this gets to a, a very tough comment to make. But my what I what I really believe, besides the fact that I am a educated person and a um, you know a tech and business professional, I also believe that grades and degrees can be um, institutionalized structured violence in people's minds, right? And people can think that, oh, if I don't snap to this structure, and this is what I was saying during my presentation as well, if I don't snap to the education system, there's no way I can ever achieve success, which is not true. It just, it will be a harder pathway, right? Uh, but we live in a society that is built around capitalism, that is rooted in money, 
equals resources and success, job titles and degrees are a pathway to A, B, and C, you know, money and success, right? And it's this narrative by the media and also narrative by our institutions and narrative that we tell ourselves as individuals because that's how our society is built, um, that we have to go along the pathway of uh, earn your college degree, earn your graduate degree in order to achieve success. And there, there are many pathways to how you can achieve success, but the way that our society has been set up is this is the surest way to check the boxes is if you do an advanced degree, if you get an MBA, if you do A, B, and C, it'll lead to these uh, career opportunities, which then turn themselves into money, salary, resources, medical benefits, things of that nature. I was just having a conversation with my, my new manager and then also with a new teammate about um, medical care, medical uh, health insurance, and uh, particularly around uh, dental care. I've had to go to the dentist several times in the last four months. It's, it's a whole thing. And, but I was, I was saying to my colleague and to my manager, like, I'm so glad I work at Microsoft and this health insurance is so good, right? And even the thought pattern of that, of like, oh, I have to think about getting a job with a strong salary so I can be a homeowner. Sure, that's one train of thought. I have to get a job with a competitive healthcare package for my family and for myself in order to maintain in a certain way. These narratives that we tell ourselves are because that's how our society is set up. And knowing that, and okay, if I get a master's in business analytics or MBA, this is a pathway that's going to make it more likely that I will have medical insurance, a high paying job, and have the visibility and access to get into a company like Microsoft, Amazon, Google, or become a lawyer if you went to the great law school at Seattle U, which my best friend did, which is why I have to mention the law school. So things of that nature, right? And so it, it takes us along this pathway of, oh, I learned the system. There's actually a really great student development theory on this. It's called Community Cultural Wealth by Tara Yasso. Look it up. Um, and it talks about the idea that we access capital and wealth, not just monetary success, but through our familiar capital, through our social capital, through our resistance capital. And there's three other elements in there as well. I'm not going to name them all. You should definitely look it up. Tara Yasso, Y-O-S-S-O. -S -S um, and she talks about this, this idea that we all learn a certain level of grit and resistance capital by learning the system. And you have to learn how to game the system. And this, this gets back to the idea of degrees and hierarchy, right? Like, oh, MBA is a better degree than, you know, a master's in other areas, right? It's this psychological, um, in this psychological message that's ingrained in us by being a part of the institution of higher education. Um, there's, there's so much mental structured violence that can happen when we buy into that narrative, which can then yield itself to imposter syndrome as well. There's, but I, I say all of this, knowing that we are all a part of these systems um, as a, a space of awareness, like we are making a choice by having awareness of what it means to exist within the higher ed system, because we're all making an exchange. We're giving our time so that we can earn a degree so that we can get a job at a company that you know provides us with x y or z salary and or uh, start our own companies or whatever the the interest and desire might be and so there's there's a a, a warning in my message and in my answer to this question but there's also the point of awareness like once you're once what is again maya angelou can't get away from her she's so wonderful <laughs> she says once you know better you do better <laughs> So having that awareness, uh, just it, hopefully it makes you a more informed person around how you want to navigate the system, what degree program you choose, um, and what you do with your education once you have that degree and how you help others and bring others along. Because that's, I think, also a, a pathway to, I was going to say retribution, for lack of a better word. <laughs> pathway to retribution is mentoring others and sharing your knowledge with others. That makes sense. So uh, like my next question is regarding how to address the issue. Mm -hmm. So you said like uh, we should like first learn to implement it on ourselves rather than help like uh, before helping others. Mm -hmm. How can managers or colleagues identify others with imposter syndrome and how can they help the employee when addressing the issue? 
Yeah, I mean, this is gonna sound like a very strong statement, but I mean every word of it. Assume everybody has it. This is like, <laughs> oof, this is a, it's a very bad example and it's too soon, but it's like the commercials we saw early on and actually throughout, throughout the pandemic. Um, assume everybody has this virus and, and do your best to protect yourself, right? Uh, similarly, so uh, assume everybody is battling uh, imposter syndrome. Really, really great quote I heard many years ago that I still that still sticks with me. Um, it says, you know, don't don't assume that you know by the look on somebody's face what's going on with them. Assume uh, that everybody is fighting an internal battle that you know not, because that's the truth. Everybody has a different version of um, happiness, of pain, of of work that they're trying to to get through on a daily basis and many times they're they show up they meaning universal they everybody shows up to a meeting to a space with different weight on their shoulders that we can't see right and i think the the best uh approach here is to assume you as an individual are going through um issues with your family your friends your workplace your academic program um, just existing as a human in this very complicated world, assume that everybody else uh, that's human, you know, everybody um, is going through their own version of stress, of trials and tribulation and assume best intent, but assume that things aren't personal. If someone comes to a meeting and they're, un they're not prepared, perhaps they were up all night with their child or their elderly parent or they themselves were sick and they're just, this is not their day, right? We all deserve grace. We all deserve another opportunity to show up as our best selves at a different point in time. Um, but I think it's safe and, and practical to assume it's not personal when somebody shows up and they didn't prioritize your needs and your, your availability to complete this group project over their availability and need to exist as a human, right? Um, so many things are not personal. It's personal about the person themselves who wasn't able to complete the group project or wasn't able to, um, you know, facilitate whatever the need or the, the task was. But it's very rarely like, I'm trying to hurt Keisha on purpose. I'm going to not write my paragraph as part of this group paper, or I'm going to not do my part of this work. Sure, sometimes people are not you know, the entire quarter goes by, they didn't contribute anything, that's suspicious. Um, if it's a one-off situation, they're battling with whatever weight is on their shoulder and that may or may not have anything to do with you, right? Thank you for such a wonderful answer. Um, would you recommend any books or podcast on the topic of imposter syndrome? This is <laughs> this is a really good question, and I would I would frame it as um, not necessarily about the topic of imposter syndrome, but more around what are the. And this is why I showed that slide about the the strengths finder and um, what's the other one the insights is what's the investigation that you're doing around getting to know yourself. Have you taken some time to really reflect on who you are as a person, as a leader, as an individual, as a human existing within the multiple communities that we're all a part of, your own family, your friends, work, so on and so forth. Um, and that I think is a better assessment of what it is that you as an individual need. Cause I like, absolutely, I will tell you, I thought Michelle Obama's book Becoming was fantastic on the idea of moving through different aspects and chapters of her life and the success she's achieved even outside of her husband right and like their whole dynasty and legacy they've built but about becoming her own person great book that dives into self-awareness hard work imposter syndrome combating that so many different things right um there are really fantastic books that i've read about um, self-development and uh, mental models around strength. Brene Brown is brilliant. She has such a catalog of books and TED Talks where she talks about shame, identity, um, how we interact with other people and how that allows us to show up and grow as individuals in relationships with other folks. Brilliant, brilliant book. Um, books. She has multiple books. That. What was that book called? Um, which one? 
the one that you said the name something brown what was the oh book? Brene brown she's a professor okay. at um she had university of houston i believe she's a professor in psychology and she has books like daring greatly um daring the lead she has a whole catalog of books but her name is Brene brown you could find her and see her whole entire catalog she has many talks many ted talks as well um some of them are even on netflix you know it's a good 45 minute watch i watched one a few weeks ago with my sisters that was super dynamic um she's really fantastic there are podcasts that i oh another question i have posted okay, thank you oh, oh go ahead i have posted the link in the chat if someone oh, perfect. perfect thank you um there's there are podcasts that i really enjoy that dive into mental models around money right um, that's another one where a lot of people have imposter syndrome of like, I, I haven't made this much money or I don't understand credit card debt or I don't understand how to buy a home, things of that nature. And I was just having this conversation. I'm, I'm like always having conversations, right? Like just so human of me. Um, I was having a conversation yesterday with my, my manager about um, the idea that institutional um, wealth in this not institution intergenerational wealth in this country is built a lot around home ownership so the majority of folks in this country the way you become you acquire wealth and pass it to your next generation is through owning a home uh, the process of learning how to become a homeowner can be either super convoluted and tricky which i think 89 percent of folks in america would say it is super convoluted and tricky and then some people were like no it, it makes perfect sense my parents were a homeowner they told me to do a b and c they gave me a down payment and it all worked out fine right this is another element of imposter syndrome i'm going to dive into for a second the idea of access money resources of intergenerational access is huge especially in this country that's so rooted in capitalism um, my, my mother has, has, you know, since I was born, my mother's always owned a house and, um, my parents got divorced and then my mother, uh, reassessed how she wanted to be a homeowner. And it was, there was like a year or two, we lived in an apartment and then she became a homeowner again. So all, all of my 35 years of living, 33 of them, my mom has always been a homeowner. So I always thought like, oh, a pathway of success is being a homeowner. My mom never told me. Keisha, this is how you become a homeowner. <laughs> uh, these are the steps you have to take, especially in her situation as a woman who worked full time and then was a single mom with five kids. That that storyline was never explained to me. And there was a bit of imposter syndrome that I had as a young woman coming out of college around like, I guess I should go rent an apartment now, like, or buy a house, but I don't really know how to do that. And so I didn't buy my house until I was 32. And there was a decade of time where I could have been building uh, equity had I known the pathway, had I stepped out of my own space of, oh, maybe I'll ask my mom or I'll ask a financial advisor, or I'll ask a mortgage uh, loan officer how to, how to pursue this pathway, right? Which is why they have classes that are first time home buyers because a lot of people have nervousness around asking the questions of how do I do this? I actually, I don't know, you know? And so anyways, I say all this to say there are great, uh, so many podcasts, Brown Ambition is one of my favorite ones. The Budgetista is a great one as well around the pathway of building wealth and getting out of your own way in terms of the mental block of, oh, I feel like an imposter because I should know this. How do I figure out how to do a down payment and to apply for a mortgage and all of those different things? There's some very specific steps to it. Now that I've done it, my mind is flipped and I'm like, that was a very easy process. No, it wasn't easy. It was easy because I worked at Microsoft. I was making a lot of money and my down payment was just there unless you have materialized a bucket of, it wasn't just there, I worked hard for it, right? Unless you've materialized a bucket of money and overcome that first financial barrier, the imposter syndrome of how to become a homeowner continues to be a blocker, right? So there's so many podcasts that are out there about, um, you know, money management around, I, uh, you know, focusing your credit score, things of that nature that I think are so important. Um, I just mentioned a couple of them, Brown Ambition, um, Budgenisa podcast, um, but there's, there's a lot of work getting back to my statement before that we need to do of uh, do the assessment on yourself. And maybe it's not like, you know, the Myers-Briggs or insights or strength finder. Maybe it's some other type of, of process and work that you go through so that you figure out what are your 
gap areas, your areas of opportunity, as we would say at Microsoft, your areas of opportunity where you're like, these are the three things that I want to focus on in 2021. I want to focus on my health and fitness. I want to focus on um, the amount of content I'm consuming. I want to focus on spending time with my family, whatever it is. I want to focus on saving money and being intentional about it, not just letting saving happen to me, right? There's research that goes into it. It's not just you woke up like this, like I'm all glamorous and ready for my, my fancy photo shoot. That's not reality. <laughs> this is reality. Like I'm sitting at home and I have my best yoga pants on a cool zip up sweater <laughs> and I'm doing this work. I'm reading. I am making a plan of action for myself. Um, that is, I think, the the getting in the details of how you combat imposter syndrome, whether it's journaling, whether it's you talk to a therapist or you talk to a professional career coach or whatever that looks like for you. It's doing the work of investigating who are you as an individual, what do you need, and what are three things, keep it simple, three things that you can do in the next year that feed into that goal every month, every week, that come back to those three things. It's having that focus, but it really starts with doing the inside work, like the toolkit I was talking about, doing that work where you investigate yourself enough to know I'm, I'm worth everything that I want to achieve in my life, absolutely, but it's not gonna fall out of the sky. It's not gonna be handed to me on a platter. I have to work for it. I have to create the networks. I have to have the conversations. I have to career coach, uh, doctors, uh, nutritionists, whatever, whoever those folks are, or if it's your own family or your own friends, your own community, having an accountability group, work on <laughs> the plan that you need to have for yourself and don't assume someone's going to hand it to you. I'm glad I had this glass of water. <laughs> Lots of talking. Uh, I have a question in chat. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you first realize that this was a topic important to you and that you wanted to share your thoughts with others? Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> I, um, wow, probably in college, I had a really insightful mentor and this story is going to take a different turn, but I had a really great mentor and he was my uh, academic advisor, college mentor. I, you know, still, still have a great friendship and a uh, mentoring relationship with him to this day. And he, he, my, I think my freshman year actually introduced me to the concept of student development um, theory and just taught me a, a myriad of, of different topics around what it means to have a different life experience as a black woman for me, as someone that grew up in the inner city, as someone who's a child of divorced parents, what it means for me to show up to a collegiate environment and set a plan and thrive and, and do it in my own terms, in my own way, which might not look like the stereotypical path to success. And I, <laughs> I realized some years later that I allowed my mentor to have such a, a space of influence in my mind as a way of combating imposter syndrome I was doing it in a very peculiar way. I was saying, well, here's a mentor. He's giving me great advice about what I should do with my academic career, what I should do in my professional career. He's so supportive. He's super awesome. And it took me a solid decade to realize I was using him as a crutch for a long time. And he, uh, you know, he suggested that I should do the master's program in student development because he did the master's program in student, uh, student affairs at the, at the school that he went to. Um, and things of that nature. And it and it, whew, it took me until I was in grad school to realize how much influence I allowed this person to have in my life um, and how his suggestions directed my pathway. And that helped me combat a lot of feelings of like, oh, I'm a black woman and these academic programs are in these spaces or in this space in my career. I don't have a lot of folks that look like me in this space. Um, there's a, kind of a, a partnership and a working connection I have with this person. He's going to help me figure it all out. Um, and later in life, I really started <laughs> investigating how much of the work I was doing myself and how much I was dependent on his advice. Not to say that he was giving bad advice um, or by any means. Like I, I made a lot of life decisions that I'm very proud of, um, but it was really in my time in college and my I hate to use word codependency. Sometimes that happens in college though. You start becoming codependent on your academic advisors and your resident hall director and those folks and, and those relationships. And it can 
it can lead to you not utilizing your own brain to think for yourself. And so I would caution that. So this story did take a, probably a strange turn, but to Alejandro's point, that's where, when I was in college, when I started really thinking about and investigating the idea of imposter syndrome, but I wasn't able to name it in this way until post-grad school. So that's, it, it was a journey. <laughs> Thank you, Keisha, for all the responses. Now I would like to ask uh, um, Carol and uh, Mary to continue. Thanks, Bhagyashi. Really appreciate the questions. Thank you, students. Alejandra, thank you for your question too in the chat. Wonderful. Keisha, wonderful. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. Um, Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So fortunate to have you with us today. So. Um, Carol, any, any words? No, I just, uh, again, thank you to all the uh, participating uh, groups that came together and made this happen. Keisha, thank you. Come back as an alumni. Um, is there a way students can connect with you after this? Or how can, you know, what's the best way to follow up with you? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to drop my LinkedIn uh, into the um, chat in just a moment here. Please do follow up with me. I, I was on the um, the virtual career night last week with Albers, and I had probably 15 students follow up with me after that. Like, I will accept your invite. I will, be, I will welcome a conversation with you. Thank you so much. And um, to Graduate Student Council, I'm so happy that we were able to partner with you and we look forward to future partnerships. And of course, the Albus Placement Center, Mary Lou has been fantastic. She's actually, she's the one who was the main driver today with, with uh, inviting our guests today, as well as um, Abby, Barr and Justin, who have also been helping us with the Courageous Career Conversations. Stay tuned, we will have more Courageous Career Conversations coming up in spring quarter and as well as another one in uh, fall quarter. So thank you all for your participation today.